Hello, my name is Troy Thuma. I'm from PDQ Manufacturing Technical Support, and I'll be trying to give you an overview, uh, kind of a 10,000 foot uh, view of what a car wash is, uh, what makes a good car wash, and how the car wash should be operated. So let's get started. Uh, what is a car wash? Well, the basic concept of a car wash is quite simple. Dirty car goes into the wash, uh, several processes occur, and a clean, clean car is going to come out. Uh, this can be accomplished in many ways. Um, there's two basic types of car washes. We have in-bay automatic and also tunnel. Uh, in-bay automatic, uh, when the wash is issued, uh, the vehicle is going to drive in to the bay under its own power. It's going to enter the loading system and be told to stop. The wash is going to occur automatically and uh, the vehicle drive out and uh, when the wash is completed. Friction is one type of in-bay automatic car wash. Uh, the cleaning portion of the wash is going to be accomplished using brushes. Uh, typically there are side brushes and top brushes. Uh, there can be a top brush and a side brush only. There can be maybe a top brush or two top brushes and several side brushes. Sometimes you have brushes for the wheels. Uh, that's friction cleaning, all accomplished with brushes. As far as touchless goes, the cleaning of the portion of the wash is going to be accomplished using a combination of detergents and high pressure spray. About a thousand PSI is typical on the high pressure spray. So nothing's physically going to touch the surface of the vehicle. Okay, so in a tunnel, when the wash is issued, uh, the vehicle is going to be loaded onto a conveyor uh, by the attendant or maybe the customer. Um, and then the vehicle is going to be moved through a series of cleaning devices uh, automatically in the tunnel. Um, there may be some detailing at the end of it, uh, a dryer or something like that. Uh, maybe you have some attendants that will uh, dry the car with some towels. Uh, there's a couple of different types of tunnels. Uh, a mini tunnel would be one. It's going to be very short, kind of an express tunnel. Uh, friction tunnels, typically the cleaning portion of this is going to be used, uh, we're going to use brushes to clean the vehicle. In a touchless, of course, it's going to be high pressure spray and a combination of detergents and high pressure spray. A hybrid tunnel is kind of the same. Um, the cleaning portion is going to use brushes as well as detergents and high pressure spray. A uh, type of cleaning is typically selected by the customer when they're purchasing the wash. So they can say, yes, I would like either a friction wash, a touchless wash, or a combination of both. Self-serve car washes, uh, it's really just the customer pulls into the bay, uh, they park by themselves, and uh, typically a spray, wa a spray wand is used, um, and they'll clean their vehicle themselves. There could be a brush and some other options in the bay uh, that they can use. Okay, so let's talk about water. Uh, several different types of water that is used in the car wash. Uh, first, we're going to talk about fresh water. And this comes from an external source, such as city water or a well. It's generally untreated and often referred to as hard water. Uh, the hardness of the water is expressed in grains of hardness. And essentially, this means how much uh, minerals are in the water. Uh, you have magnesium, calcium, and some other minerals that could be there. Uh, soft water is going to be treated with a water softener. So you'll see that as the resin or as the water passes through the resin in the water softener canister, it's going to cause an ion exchange. So the calcium and the magnesium ions are going to be replaced with sodium ions. Uh, soft water is going to react, react less with the detergents when mixed. And uh, it's going to clean better when applied to the surface of the vehicle. So you know, with hard water, it would tend to react with the detergent. And now you're essentially cleaning the water versus cleaning the surface of the vehicle, which is what you want. Uh, soft water is not going to react with the detergents. Therefore, all the power, the cleaning power, is going to be on the surface of the vehicle. Okay, so another type of water used in a car wash is reverse osmosis. And this is water treated with a reverse osmosis system. Now, it sounds very technical and complicated, but generally it's referred to as spot-free water. Uh, it's typically used in the last rinse, and it's very close to pure water. 
so then when it evaporates, it doesn't leave a spot. There's nothing in the water that would leave a spot. Okay, so reclaimed water uh, is water treated with a reclaimed system. Uh, some municipalities, uh, some states require that you have a reclaimed system. Uh, we're going to, the water that's used in the car washing is essentially goes into a tank and we can reclaim that water to use in some cycles like underbody, uh, high pressure rents, uh, anything that doesn't really require any type of cleaning, we're just blasting that dirt debris off the side of the vehicle. Okay, so a car wash can also use hot water. Um, use a water heater to make that hot water. Uh, usually about 120 degrees Fahrenheit is what's used. Uh, it helps the detergents to react better as well as get a cleaner rinse on the vehicle. Uh, think of it as you wouldn't do dishes with cold water. You want to use the hot water to get a better clean. So now let's talk about chemicals. Uh, several different types of chemicals. One is going to be the detergents. Uh, they would react with uh, bugs, oil, other things that are on the vehicle, uh, the road grime. Whatever makes the vehicle dirty. Uh, so detergents can be mixed with air to create a foam and the foam actually uh, kind of creates a, a mechanical uh, cleaning process as it kind of comes down the side of the vehicle. Um, this is going to uh, loosen up the bugs and the dirt and everything that's on the vehicle so that when you come through with a high pressure uh, water pass uh, or you use a brush, uh, that's going to clean that from the surface of the vehicle. So there's two different types of chemical kind of categorized by the pH level. A high pH is anything above 7. And the high pH is going to be uh, an alkaline. And it's going to react with the organics uh, such as bugs, tar, uh, oils, grease. Uh, low pH is going to be anything less than 7. And uh, that's going to be considered an acid. Now that's going to react with things like uh, minerals, anything that's not organic. And it's mostly effective on glass and chrome. So most car washes would use a two-step process where they would apply one and then another. Uh, some of them don't. Some of them, you know, the, the detergent is uh, kind of a, a dual action cleaner. Waxes. Uh, so a wax is intended to coat and protect the surface of the vehicle and kind of make it shine. Um, it treats the actual surface of the vehicle and not really the water. Unlike waxes, you, know, you can have a drying agent and what a drying agent does is it reacts more with the water and not with the surface of the vehicle. Uh, so what that does is it kind of creates surface tension in the water. Now normally water wants to lay flat on a vehicle, but when you add a drying agent it causes the surface tension to increase and then that water kind of balls up and then when you hit it with a dryer, it's able to just kind of roll right off the surface of the vehicle. Now let's talk about ancillary equipment. Um, this is just the peripheral equipment that's associated with a car wash. Okay, let's talk about dryers. A uh, dryer is used to blow a huge amount of air at the vehicle surface and it just basically pushes that water off the side of the vehicle. A uh, couple different types are standalone dryer. A uh, standalone dryer really just stands outside the, the exit end of the car wash um, so that um, you know, as the, the wash ends, the vehicle is just going to drive underneath it and blow that water off the surface of the vehicle. An onboard dryer is attached on board of the car wash equipment. So after the wash is completed, uh, the bridge or the gantry, whatever type of equipment you have, would have a dryer on it that is pulled over the vehicle automatically so that the vehicle doesn't drive through, but the dryer goes over top of the vehicle. A lot of times uh, these are used when noise is an issue. Um, you can dry the vehicle with the door closed. An air compressor may be needed to supply high pressure air uh, for mixing with the detergents or the waxes to create that foam. Uh, could be used for opening and closing valves on the car wash itself or moving air cylinders. Uh, maybe it's used to open and close the doors. Water softener uh, is also used in the car wash. Um, it 
converts the hard water over to soft water. Uh, we talked about this before, but uh, really what it does is increases the cleaning capability of that detergent. Uh, it's not going to be able to react with the hardness of the water itself and get a better clean on the surface of that vehicle. Another reason you would have to use water softener is because your reverse osmosis system can't be fed hard water. It needs to be fed soft water so it can go through the filtering process. And again, what it does is water goes through the canister and as it goes up through the canister, it goes through the resin and it creates an ion exchange. So the sodium ion uh, is replaced by the magnesium and the calcium ions which are going to stick to the resin. Uh, after the resin is kind of saturated with these ions, uh, then it would go through a, um, a regeneration process and that water would be dumped down the drain and the, uh, the resin and the water softener would be regenerated and ready for new water. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about reverse osmosis. Uh, reverse osmosis system will generate spot-free water, typically using the final rents, um, and uh, doesn't really have to be used on the final rents all the time. Uh, sometimes it can be used as a detergent. We talked about soft water, how it becomes uh, more effective uh, when you're mixing the detergent with the soft water. Uh, but reverse osmosis or spot-free water, it really kind of supercharges that, um, that chemical, the detergents, and you get a really good clean. Now, to create reverse osmosis water, um, it takes about one gallon for every, it'll create one gallon for every three gallons that are rejected. Um, so that reject water could either go down the drain or you could have a tank that would uh, capture that reject water so that you could use it kind of like a reclaim water, uh, maybe for the underbody flush uh, or a high pressure rinse or something that doesn't really matter if there's a lot of minerals in that water. So in order to create the reverse osmosis or the spot free water, uh, a membrane is going to be used, uh, essentially a canister about so long, maybe this big around, and a pump is going to pressurize the water and uh, push it through the canister. The uh, Reverse osmosis water is going to come out the other side and then the reject water would go a different path. So spot-free water is measured in TDS or total dissolved solids. Uh, the TDS must be under 30 parts per million to be considered spot-free water. And again, with the total dissolved solids uh, being so low, essentially you have pure water and when it evaporates, it's not going to create those tiny little spots that are all over the vehicle when you get home. Okay, so let's talk about reclaim. Uh, reclaim water is really just water that's been used to wash the car, and it typically would go down the drain, but we can also capture that water in a reclaim system, and uh, we can reuse that in the car wash. Uh, so it's gonna, after it's done washing a car, it's gonna go down into a tank, and typically it'll have a couple of different levels in this tank. Uh, one is going to filter out uh, everything that sinks, uh, any contaminant that sinks, and then the next stage would be to filter out any contaminant that floats. And then the third stage uh, typically is the reclaimed water uh, that can be treated with uh, uh, some type of chemical, uh, maybe an ozone uh, generator would also um, clean up that water, and it'll be recirculated uh, for use on demand. What we're going to filter out of the water is going to be, you know, grit, oil, grease, anything that floats, um, paper cups, whatever you have. So there's a couple of different types of reclaim systems. Uh, they include, but are not limited to, uh, the basic filter method. Uh, really what it does is it just pushes the water through a series of filters uh, and reclaim water comes out the other side. Another type is going to be the centrifugal. Uh, really what happens here is water is kind of spun around really fast and uh, that separates all the contaminants out and uh, you end up with the reclaimed water on the other side. Now let's move on to water heaters. A water heater uh, can be either gas or electric. 
Um, and really what it's going to do is just heat the water. Uh, again, think of dishes. Uh, you wouldn't clean your dishes in cold water. You want hot water to get that really good clean. Um, so the hot water is typically going to be used in the detergents as well as the high pressure rinse. Okay, so let's talk about signage. Um, normally there's a sign in the bay. Uh, it's an instructional sign that's used to uh, give the, the customer loading information. Uh, drive forward, back up, stop. Another sign that could be in the bay would be the confirmation sign. Used to indicate which cycle is in the wash you're at, uh, which chemical is being applied. An entrance sign would be on the entrance side of the car wash and it's usually used to indicate whether the wash is busy uh, or whether you're able to pull into the bay. Open and close sign simply indicates that when the car wash is open and when it's closed. Okay, so now that we've talked about a lot of the components that go into a car wash, uh, let's see what it would look like if we drove through a car wash and identify all the components uh, that you would normally see in that car wash. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the entry unit. Uh, the entry unit, of course, is where you pay for the car wash. Um, several different ways and several different types of entry units available. Uh, but I'm going to show you a typical setup for the entry unit or the wash activation, it's sometimes called. Um, so we'll have a wash activation here. Um, as the vehicle drives in, they're going to see this panel. Um, there could be a keypad and maybe a screen on it. And uh, there could be maybe a credit card reader, a bill acceptor, um, some things. You know, you can put cash in here, credit card, or type in a code of some type. Okay, so this kiosk sits out in front of the car wash, of course, uh, the activation, the wash activation. And uh, electrically, it probably needs some power to it, as well as uh, maybe it goes through uh, to the C store to some type of code generator. Okay, so the code generator, or a POS, a point of sale, uh, could be tied to the cash register system here, and then maybe tied over here to the gas pumps. So a customer could go inside the C-Store and issue a code, uh, or they could issue the code directly from uh, the gas pump. And when they come around here to pay at the car wash, they would just type in this code. There would be some communication back and forth. Yes, the wash is good. So the activation unit would trigger the car wash. Uh, they could maybe put cash in, and that cash, uh, once you perform a successful transaction, uh, would issue the car wash again or even with a credit card. Uh, with a credit card, uh, could be two ways of doing that. Uh, one would be a dedicated phone line. Uh, so as you swipe that, that credit card, um, it would dial out to a server and uh, authorize that credit card. Uh, the other type would be if this is connected to the internet, then you could swipe your credit card. It would go out to a different type of server on the internet and uh, no dial-out connection would be necessary, and it would just perform that transaction. Uh, maybe it's not connected here. Maybe you have a off-site code system. An off-site code system may exist at a different off-site uh, gas station or oil uh, lube, lube shop or something like that. And uh, they're just really not even connected. You know, there's no physical wires connecting the two. Uh, the offsite code system, if you generate one on that kiosk, it would uh, take into account you know, the day, uh, the package type, where it's located, where that, that, uh, that code generator is located, and um, some other factors. Uh, security code may be in there, and it just kind of uh, generates a uh, code that is encrypted so that when you come back over here and you type that code in, uh, this unit, based off of that code, would understand where it was generated, uh, if there's a security code to it, uh, what day it was generated, and if everything checks out, then it'll go ahead and issue that car wash. We'll just draw a typical aerial view of a car wash here. And then our entry station would be down here where we pay, and the vehicle would pull up and of course pay for that car wash, but then after they do, um, 
out here, maybe there's an entrance sign. And the entrance sign would say either drive forward or wait. You know, maybe there's a vehicle that's actually currently washing. So uh, when the wash is available, uh, you would get your drive forward indication here. Um, when the vehicle drives into the bay, they would have another sign, the in-bay sign, uh, that would tell the vehicle to drive forward, stop, back up, uh, depending on where they're actually uh, positioned in the bay. So as they drive in, um, there may be, there may be a, a, a virtual treadle or a steel treadle. Um, if it's a steel treadle, really what they have is just kind of a plate right here, uh, or some type of uh, mechanical mechanism that would sense when the wheel pulls onto uh, this uh, mechanical switch. So it's a kind of a physical uh, piece of equipment that's actually in the bay on the floor that you have to drive on top of. A virtual treadle is a little bit different. Um, you may have some ultrasonics over here uh, that will measure the side of the vehicle as it drives into the bay. Uh, so as it's pulling through, we're getting the width of the vehicle. And then there could be some photoelectric guys uh, that would sense when the vehicle's actually in place. Uh, instead of photoelectric eyes, there could be ultrasonics or something that detects the front of the vehicle. So now the vehicle is loaded. If we went too far, it would tell us to back up. And if we backed up too far, it would tell us to drive forward. But then once we get the stop indication, something's going to happen in here. You know, this is what's going to wash the vehicle. A couple of different pieces of equipment that could be in the bay. Um, usually referred to is either a bridge or a gantry. So a bridge system uh, would be a piece of equipment that's kind of up above on some rails. And uh, there may be some rails kind of coming down through the bay. And if we looked at that from the side, we would see you know, some rails mounted up high. And then there may be a bridge here. A trolley, you know, that bridge, that bridge would move back and forth or kind of uh, forward and backwards in the bay. The trolley would move side to side. And then attached to that trolley, you would have a spray arch uh, or an arm, uh, a wand, sometimes it's referred to. And really all it does is it applies chemical or sprays high pressure water at the side of the vehicle. So this is typically referred to as a bridge. Uh, what else could be in here? You know, we could have a, a gantry. A gantry is normally mounted on the floor. So maybe we'd have some rails or what looks like railroad tracks kind of on the floor there. And then The gantry would be a floor mounted uh, mechanism that would kind of go over top of the vehicle back and forth. Uh, in this gantry you could have pretty much anything. Um, there may be some nozzles on the sides of it that would spray or up above. Uh, it could be high pressure. Uh, so far we've talked about just touch free cleaning here. Uh, this process would be touch free. Uh, a gantry could also be touch free. Um, you could also have a friction car wash that would wash the vehicle over here. And a little bit different. So instead of using a high pressure spray, we could use, maybe there's a brush uh, for the side of the vehicle. And then there could be a brush for the top of the vehicle that comes down and scrubs that vehicle. Uh, here, you know, we could have some brushes on the side that move in and out. And then we may have some brushes up on the top that would also come down and wash the top of the vehicle. Now, you could have two brushes. Uh, you could have three brush, or this could be uh, also another term for this is a rollover. Um, so you could have a three brush rollover. Uh, you might have two side brushes on each side and give you a total of five, or maybe you have two top brushes 
Uh, you could have six, but who knows how many uh, brushes could be in the bay or attached to the gantry. So this gantry is going to move or this bridge is going to move uh, back and forth over the vehicle. But now what we have to do is actually clean the vehicle. So normally the first step would be to apply some type of detergent. So you could apply a two-step process or maybe it's just a single step chemical. Uh, but what it does is it applies the detergent to the side of the vehicle. Uh, it's going to loosen up the bugs and the dirt and the the bird droppings or whatever may be on that vehicle uh, that's causing it to be dirty. Uh, so we apply our pre-soak, that's referred to as a pre-soak, and uh, that loosens up this. Now what we have to do is we have to get that dirt off of the side of the vehicle. So we can use either the brush that's going to kind of come through and scrub it. Think about that as uh, manually doing dishes in your sink. Uh, so, you know, you get your hot water and your soap and you start scrubbing those dishes and you're going to rinse them off and put them in the dish rack. Uh, that's going to be this friction type cleaning. Now, the other type of cleaning would be touch free cleaning. So we have our trolley that moves left and right there. And we have a spray arch it's going to go around and apply a chemical. And then after that, it's going to use high pressure spray out of some nozzles that's going to clean that vehicle. And think of this as touch-free cleaning, more of, I got my dishes, I'm going to throw them in the dishwasher, throw a couple of packets of soap in there, close her up, and let it run its cycle. So this is kind of more like a dishwasher. This is kind of more like doing it by hand. Okay, so let's look at touch-free cleaning and friction cleaning a little bit more closely. Um, there are some advantages and disadvantages of both. Uh, for the time being, we'll call this um, touch-free cleaning. And here we'll call this friction cleaning and we can just put our vehicle inside that bay. Um, again, you know, this would be like uh, putting your uh, dishes in the dishwasher, right? Nothing's touching. Uh, your dishes or your vehicle, you know, nothing's actually touching it. Uh, in here, we're doing everything through a mechanical action. Uh, so these brushes are coming down and they're actually touching the side of the vehicle. Uh, is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I think both of them can be good. Um, however, some considerations would be, uh, in a touch-free cleaning environment, uh, we don't really have any mechanical action other than um, you know, maybe the suds kind of working on the side of the vehicle a little bit uh, could be considered a mechanical action. But really, everything is just not touching the side of the vehicle, which is good. Uh, if you don't want anything touching the side of your vehicle, maybe these brushes are kind of scary. Um, they're actually coming in and, you know, rubbing against a, a vehicle. Uh, Touch-free cleaning, you wouldn't have those brushes uh, touching the side of the vehicle. It could be considered an advantage. Now, friction cleaning is a little different. Uh, we're not cleaning with just the chemicals. Uh, we have this mechanical action. Okay, so now that we've talked about what touch-free cleaning is and what friction cleaning is, uh, the next question you probably have is, which one is going to be better? Well, the short answer is, it depends. So, it all really depends on how you're cleaning the vehicle. Um, First of all, we need to get a good size on that vehicle. Uh, once we determine what size it is, then we can accurately wash that vehicle. So let's talk about a little bit about touchless uh, car washing and uh, what's involved in sizing that vehicle. Now, before we were looking at our uh, virtual treadle system, and I'll focus on that because it's going to be the most accurate system. As the vehicle drives into the bay, remember, we had our ultrasonics on the sides. And really all it is is a sensor that sends out a, a sound pulse. And based off the timing of that, we can determine how wide that vehicle is. So we can capture these two edges uh, down to about a millimeter, uh, seeing how wide that vehicle is. And that's important because we want to stay the optimal distance off of that vehicle in order to clean it. 
The next step is determine how long the vehicle is. So as it pulls in and it goes into the loading system, it doesn't matter whether it's uh, photoelectric eyes or whether it's ultrasonics. I'm just going to shorten my vehicle up just a little bit. Uh, we can use photoelectric eyes to say, aha, that's the front of the vehicle. Um, ultrasonics could also do the same thing by sensing the floor uh, in front of the vehicle and not the floor, which would essentially be the vehicle. So now we have identified that front end of the vehicle. We have the sides, we have the front. Next step, let's find the back of the vehicle. So as the wash begins, uh, whether your gantry or your bridge is starting at the back or at the front, uh, it's going to catch the length of the vehicle, determine the length of the vehicle. So as it comes back, really what's happening is it's looking for the area that's not the vehicle, and at that point we can tag that as the back of the vehicle. So we have the left and the right and the front and the back. We know exactly where that vehicle is at. Uh, you know, if it's a truck, it's going to be really wide and really long. If you have a Mini Cooper or something like that, that's going to be very short and very narrow, but we can give it the uh, same wash, no matter what type of vehicle it is. As it goes around spraying the side of the vehicle, here's our spray arch uh, that's uh, cleaning this side of this vehicle. Uh, we want to stay the optimal distance off of the side of that vehicle. And it just so happens that's around 14 inches. And the reason that is, is so that the uh, nozzles won't overlap uh, or, you know, if it's too far away, uh, they would overlap and you wouldn't get a good clean on the side of the vehicle because your nozzles and the high pressure spray is kind of working against itself. Uh, or if you were too close, then you would end up with these stripes going down the side of the vehicle where you're not actually spraying that vehicle. So it's very important that as we measure the vehicle, we then are able to use our controls uh, to find the side of the vehicle and stay the optimal distance off of the side of that vehicle. And that's really what's going to get a clean car. So now you think this is great and uh, we're getting a good clean car and do all car washes use this method? Uh, no, they don't. Um, there are various different setups that you could possibly have. Um, some of the car washes would have like say a track uh, that's a specific size or something and this uh, wand or spray arch would follow that track around and it's not necessarily sizing the side of the vehicle and so you may have some overlap uh, depending on the, the width of the vehicle, uh, not all vehicles are the same. Um, the nozzles may overlap or they might get too close and you'll end up with some type of striping or something like that. And that's going to be a disadvantage of not having a sizing system like the uh, patented virtual treadle system that PDQ has. So now, after we talked about the uh, cleaning a vehicle in a touch-free environment, let's talk a little bit about brushes or a friction environment. Now again, you could have uh, any number of uh, systems that load the vehicle and size the vehicle, and maybe it doesn't do it at all. Uh, in brush washes, it's fairly typical to have a air cylinder or something that uh, essentially moves the brush in towards the vehicle and applies a certain amount of pressure. Um, so as it goes down the side of the vehicle, it's really just saying I'm kind of pressing this hard against the vehicle. Um, and, you know, it probably works okay. Uh, when we're talking about a PDQ system, we'll kind of have the same thing going on here. We'll have uh, ultrasonics that will measure the width of the vehicle and they could be mounted you know, on the side brush or the wheel, wheel, wheel brushes uh, or they could be mounted to the wall. Um, essentially the same thing's happening here. We're catching this edge of the vehicle and we're catching the other edge of the vehicle as the vehicle drives in. We'll load it using either photo eyes or some type of ultrasonic sensor. So now we've got the front of this and then we'll go ahead and measure the back of the vehicle uh, with an ultrasonic or 
some type of photo wire or something that measures that. That's the virtual treadle system. Once we get all these edges of the vehicle, then um, if we have a bridge, and that bridge may have a trolley and a side brush, for instance. Uh, the way that we do it at PDQ is um, we know where that side of the vehicle is most likely going to be based off of the measurements that we took. And then at that point, we'll move up to that position and then start to really look for that vehicle. So what we're doing is using some uh, VFDs or variable frequency drives. And what they do is allow us to get a feedback from that brush. So as it's pressing up against the vehicle, it's saying it's this hard to press against the vehicle. Um, and that's going to be a certain value that we calculate. Uh, and we can stay right on the side of that vehicle perfectly and just kind of profile it uh, as it goes front to back or left to right. And that's what's going to give us a good quality wash is staying right on the side of that vehicle uh, with not a whole lot of chance for bouncing back and forth, uh, varying air pressures or things like that. So again, we ask ourselves, what's better? Friction, touch free. Uh, again, it matters uh, how you clean the vehicle, uh, the type of components you're using to clean the vehicle, uh, the chemicals that you're using to clean the vehicle in touch-free environment. Uh, both of those things can clean the vehicle very well. Uh, we just have to make sure that uh, we're doing everything right, sizing the vehicle appropriately, using the appropriate chemicals, and uh, maintain the proper pressure on the side of the vehicle. Uh, do all manufacturers do this? Uh, no, they, they don't. Uh, here at PDQ, we, uh, with our, our virtual treadle sizing system, uh, we're able to get a very accurate read on the side of that vehicle. Okay, now if you remember, we paid for our car wash. We've driven into the bay and it sized the vehicle. At this point, we're ready to start the car wash, or the actual cleaning process. Uh, so what all would be involved in that? Well, first step is, um, as the vehicle drove in, maybe it received an underbody flush, which would clean the bottom of the vehicle. Uh, it usually happens as the vehicle drives in. Um, but once it's loaded into the system and it starts to wash, usually the first thing we start off with would be a detergent pass. Now again, this could be either a single step or it could be a two-step process with a high and a low pH. So we'll get our bay back here again and we'll put our vehicle inside the bay. It's loaded and now it's washing. So the bridge would move back and forth and the trolley would go left and right and you could be a gantry unit as well. Um, but a typical process would be to start with our two-step process uh, with the soap. And then after we're done with the two-step process, we would go into a soaking cycle or sometimes referred to as a dwell cycle. Uh, depending on the chemical being used, if it's a touch-free environment, uh, you know, you might dwell for 10 or 12 seconds. Um, on, a <clears throat> on a friction machine, maybe you wouldn't use a dwell at all because the chemical doesn't really need to work on the side of the vehicle. And that's going to be considered our pre-soak cycle. So after the pre-soak, we dwell. Once we've dwelled for the certain amount of time, at that point we're going to start either a high-pressure spray going around the vehicle using the spray arch or wand. Um, if it's a friction car wash, we'll use a brush to go around the vehicle. And this is the actual cleaning process. You know, we've loosened up those uh, soils on the vehicle, the you know, bugs and tar and the road grime. Uh, the high pressure spray would typically go at about 1,000 PSI and kind of blast that off the side of the vehicle, or the brush would use friction to go around the vehicle and use friction to clean that side of the vehicle and get rid of all those soils. After that's done, then we'll want to follow up with, um, in a friction process, we probably want to rinse the vehicle off because we've scrubbed it. <clears throat> and then after that, we would typically add our waxes in at that point. Um, 
a wax could come in several different forms. Uh, there's a foaming wax type that would go around and with a, a, the spray arch you could apply that. There could be a productivity wax and a productivity pass would be really just kind of a front to back type thing. We wouldn't go all the way around the vehicle. Uh, so a productivity wax could be um, a triple color foam or a three color foam. Uh, it's often referred to as tri-foam. Uh, or it could be some type of carnauba wax or something like that that would be applied in a, um, a productivity manner. You know, a triple foam would kind of spray from both sides in multicolors, and a carnauba wax, uh, whatever form that takes, would uh, be applied from the top down as it comes down. Now, PDQ has the uh, patented overglow system, so that applies from the top down uh, with some lights and things of that nature. Now after we've applied our wax, we could come back and use some type of sealant. So the wax again is going to affect the surface of the vehicle and get you that shine. A sealant is going to kind of seal that all in and it could come in several different forms again. Um, some of them could be a, uh, like a Rain-X type product or any other type of uh, surface protectant product. After the surface protectant is done, at that point you could uh, do a spot free rinse pass. So the whole object behind it is now once we have our clean vehicle, we have our shiny vehicle, we need to get a spot free vehicle. We don't leave any traces of um, detergents uh, or any minerals on the side of that vehicle. So we'll do a productivity pass or go all the way around in a normal pass. And uh, what we're doing is we're displacing the water that's on the vehicle with spot-free water. So again, as the vehicle drives away, if there's any water left on the surface of the vehicle, it's not going to create a spot when it evaporates. Drying agent could also be used. Uh, what that does is it reacts again with the surface tension of the water, causing it to ball up and not be able to stick to the side, of, you know, the, the top or the side of the vehicle. Spot-free water, in general, doesn't have any minerals in it, so it wants to really lay flat and stick to the side or the top of the vehicle. So it's difficult to blow that water off with the dryer. If you introduce a little drying agent into it, what it'll do is it'll ball that water up and cause it just to roll off the side of the vehicle when it goes under the dryer. Advantage of spot free would be that, yeah, the vehicle has a little bit of water on it when it leaves, but when it's gone, you wouldn't end up with any spots on the side of the vehicle. A drying agent, because it has chemical inside the water, yeah, you can blow that water off of the vehicle, but any water that's left on has the potential to create a little spot because of that chemical that's still in the water. Okay, so now that we talked about everything that's gonna happen during the car wash, or typical things that would happen during the car wash, let's talk about how we're gonna make those things happen. Um, so we got our vehicle in the bay and we have our bridge that can go around and here's our trolley and our spray arch. So we're really just kind of working our way around the vehicle. But when we do that, we need to apply that chemical, that first detergent or a wax or whatever we're doing. So you could have a pump station in a separate room. It could uh, have uh, a low pressure pump. It could have a high pressure pump. Uh, both of those things, there may be a dedicated spot free pump uh, and a series of valves that those pumps would pump the water through those valves. On top of that, there would be some injectors to pick up the chemical and we would deliver that to the bay through either an energy chain or an E-chain, we could have an umbilical going to the pump station, or we could also have some type of boom system uh, that would just follow this bridge around. So either way you do it, uh, coming from the pump station would go through the E-chain uh, boom or the umbilical, and go directly to the bridge through some hoses and go through the spray arch. Alternatively, you could have some pumps that are actually inside the bridge or the gantry. 
and those pumps could be uh, for spot free chemical delivery and there, the valves and everything could exist actually inside the bridge or the gantry. Okay, now we've pulled into the bay, uh, we're washing the car, uh, getting the chemical and high pressure rinse or maybe we're using brushes, but how does all that work? Uh, there's several different ways to make it work. Possibly you could have a central uh, cabinet or a central controller uh, several different wires would go out to various components from output or input modules and it's all kind of centralized here and controlling a bunch of the different devices. You know, this could be the bridge and then you could have your pump station over here and this cabinet would be controlling everything uh, just in one location. That's one way of doing it. But when you have more going on, it's kind of hard to run all those wires to their destinations and you know, expect everything to operate perfectly. Another way to do that would be to use a central brain, essentially a circuit board or a computer that controls the whole operation. Uh, PDQ's term for this is the conductor. Now the conductor will conduct the wash process. Connected to the conductor would be several different nodes and I'm holding one of those right in my hand. This is a PDQ node. Uh, what we have here is a bunch of inputs on the top and places where we can have a bunch of outputs. So the inputs would be things like proximity switches, uh, some types of sensors, pressure sensors, things of that nature. The outputs would be your actual valves, your pumps, your motors. Anything that we need to turn on and off would happen down here at the outputs. Anything that we need to see would happen up here at the inputs. So each one of these nodes would have a specific job to do. Uh, this one could be the bridge or gantry. This one over here may be the pump. This one over here could be for the bay. This may be the activation node. Uh, it interfaces to the entry unit to let the car wash know that there's something there. But either way, they're going to be computers. A uh, node is essentially a computer uh, that's part of a network. So we have our conductor telling each one of these nodes what to do. In this control architecture that PDQ uses, we have our conductor and then we have several different nodes. Typically these nodes are connected using ethernet or a node is essentially a part of a network. All these are networked together to perform simultaneous tasks. The bridge is in motion, the pump is running. Uh, we're sensing you know, where the vehicle is at at that point. We're turning on and off signs. So a lot of things can happen using nodes and a conductor versus just straight uh, input output. So now after we've paid for the car wash, loaded into the system, and the car wash has washed our car, it's clean. Now we need to get the car dry. Two ways to accomplish this. One would be a onboard dryer, and that dryer again would be attached to the bridge or the gantry. A series of blowers would blow air at high velocity, a lot of air, uh, that would just essentially blow the, the water right off the side of the vehicle. Alternatively, we could have a standalone dryer, and maybe that dryer might be mounted at the exit door. Several blowers, maybe there's some on the side. And as the car advances through that dryer, it'll just blow the water right off of it. Now, the advantage to having a standalone dryer would be throughput. So as this vehicle is driving into the bay, another one could be driving out of the bay and you would increase your throughput on your car wash. The disadvantage would be that there's no barrier here to keep the noise level down. So if there's an ordinance, city ordinance or something like that, maybe there's close proximity to neighbors, this might not be desirable to have a drive-through or a standalone dryer. 
an onboard dryer, you can, uh, one advantage of it would be to have the doors closed as the vehicle is drying. That's going to keep down the noise. However, it takes some time to do that in the bay. Meanwhile, the next vehicle is loading. So it's kind of a give and take, uh, but they're both, they both work really well. So that's it. That's Car Wash 101. Again, my name is Troy Thuma, and I work for PDQ Manufacturing Technical Support. Uh, for more information, you can visit www.pdqinc.com, uh, or you can just give us a call toll-free at 1-800-227-3373. Thank you.